So I, I came into aesthetics kind of by a back door, by accident. Um, originally, I wanted to be a heart surgeon and I saw a TV program on complex craniofacial surgery. This was in 1984. And it blew my mind at the dramatic changes that in this case, adolescents were undergoing as their facial bones were being shifted and moved so that they were really going from monstrous to normal. And I was so absolutely impressed by that. And having kind of an artistic background, I said, you know, I, I think I wanna do this instead. I didn't really know any plastic surgeons. Um, in fact, the ones I knew where I was training in general surgery in New York at Columbia, we didn't like because they were kind of dilettantes and they were a little bit lazy. They didn't want to come in to take care of sick patients. So anyway, I wound up in plastic surgery and um, I did my training at some really good places. And I pretty much um, over the years through my craniofacial background have evolved into primarily cosmetics and to your point, you know, facial rejuvenation. So in 2000 and one, there were some articles published about finding stem cells in our fat. So in liposuction fat, you could find these cells that were active. And it led to scientists and clinicians thinking about how could they be applied, not only in plastic surgery, but in things like patients who have heart attacks or neurologic disease or aging in general, because stem cells are uncommitted cells. They haven't made a decision what they're going to be. And as a result, because of that plasticity, they can turn into heart cells, they can turn into new blood vessels, you know, they can turn into a variety of different cell types. So that's what intrigued me initially about finding in our own bodies, basically medications that could potentially affect our aging. And so, you know, now fast forward, that was very unaccepted at the beginning. People were very frightened about stem cell therapies, or they took total advantage of publicizing it in ways that would draw patients in for stem cell breast augmentation, stem cell facelifts, but it was more the publicity, not the science behind it. And, and some of these kind of got a bad name off the, off, uh, at the beginning. Right? So... What I'm fascinated about is how did a plastic surgeon come to this field and then transform the conversations we're having around facial surgery and regeneration um, yeah. in the field of plastic surgery? Yeah, it's a, those are good questions. So for me, when I was, I, I live in San Diego, we are the number two cluster of biotech in the United States. So probably one of the leading centers in the world. So a lot of unique ideas come about here. And friends of mine, when they identified stem and regenerative cells in fat, they brought the concept to me as a clinician because I worked with them on other projects. And when they told me this immediately in my mind, what went off was if we find medications like digoxin in a plant or fungus produces penicillin, right? Well, we are very complex organisms, more complex than plants. So we're bound to have things in us that will be therapeutically useful. To we us. Have things yeah. to us. We already, we cut ourselves, we have cells that repair it. How do we harness repair? How do we harness growth and development and continue to improve our tissues rather than decline? So my first overriding concept was, this is very interesting in our field and the applications in plastic surgery you know, are manifold. So. In facial surgery, again, if you look at decline with what I discussed, and you start to think about volume, volume replacement is done by fillers right now. And fillers have very little biologic activity, a little bit with Sculptra, a little bit with radius on, on skin and tissue health. But if you start to use our own tissue, even if you're not a good responder, I mean, for instance, I could you your cells are probably really good because you look great. But let's say somebody your same age, you know, that you went to high school with has deteriorated more rapidly, probably their cells are not so ideal. So when you start 
thinking about the variability of these applications, you have to remember we're using your body. If the surgeon, a, a talented um, surgeon who understands, you know, the facial aging process or the body aging process, can pinpoint what part of the anatomy is deteriorating, you can use your human stem cells that are uh, produced and extracted from your fat. And you can inject those back into those locations. And because stem cells are agnostic, they will reproduce as the original cell of whatever needs to be repaired. So it's almost, if I can use the term, idiot proof, because your body knows what to do with the stem cell if it's reintroduced in the location where it's had atrophy. Is that correct? Well, that's that's partially true because here's the thing you you need you know stem cells themselves offer no volume so if you put like like you look really good right now so if you were to use stem cells throughout your face the effect that you would have is you'd notice your skin felt healthier you'd feel like the tissues are a little more plump because you're reviving what is existing presently but yeah. when you've lost those tissues you have to do two things you have to replace and regenerate right so, th that's, so that's my question so in your regenerative regenerative uh, facelift process you're going to you now address both and this is where your technique is so unique is unique and we've been able to show now both in patients who've had facelifts with these techniques and in patients who've just had isolated regenerative fat grafting that what happens is in contrast to what we see in all of the literature with fat grafts, facial volume declines to about a 30% improvement two years later after standard fat grafting, where you're just putting the fat in wherever it looks nice and you're not really thinking about the regenerative aspect. When, with the techniques we're using, when we do isolated fat grafting, we see about a 50% improvement in facial volume it decreases to about 30%, say from seven to 10 months, but by two years with no weight gain in the subject, it improves to almost 80% in a woman or a man under 55. So what's happening is, you know, all of the fat kind of dies, but the stem cells in the fat begin to turn into fat. They also have associated with them many growth factors and, and, and other things like exosomes, which actually talk to the other tissue, they make new blood vessels, they make the native tissue healthier. So in addition to replacing what's been lost with fat grafting, we're now using these regenerative techniques. So what I like to do is make three types of fat grafts. One goes deep below the muscle. So if you're trying to replace a deep fat pad, you're using a more structural graft because you need structure. The only reason I've always been a little bit concerned with stem cell rejuvenation is clumping. Is it possible that like early fillers, stem cell can clump underneath the skin or in areas? Fat, can cl fat definitely can clump. That's why we want a very fine fat graft closer to the surface. And that's why in the lower eyelid, we don't want to put any fat. We want to use nano fat because nano fat is a cell product. There's no structure to it. It's just cellular. You know, if you cleaned it, you could put it in the bloodstream. But it's so, so because of that, there's no clumping in the areas that you would potentially get clumping. So in the cases I treat using this technique, we have no, nobody who's, re, who's had fat grafts needing to be removed because because they're visible. So um, I'm 47, so I'll use me as an example. Previously, my only, my options are threading, PRP, laser, um, filler uh, for structure and volume and tightness. Uh, and then maybe in my early 50s, I would consider a mini facelift. Right. So you're now saying that with this facial rejuvenation technique, anyone who's currently using filler, so depend whatever age you are, you right. could potentially use your own bioproducts and fat exactly. to have exactly. a treatment. So if I was comparing it 
as a cost, for example, is it like for like? It's no, because imagine putting 40 milliliters of filler in. That's 40 syringes. Yes. Okay, maybe that's gonna cost you $20,000 for something that maybe will last you up to two years. And as you decay, are not replacing anything, just camouflaging the decay. Yes. What I'm trying to do is reverse decay and make the tissue healthier. So if your decay curve is like this, now it changes like that. It's like somebody saying to you, you know, if you change your diet, you're gonna live 10% longer and you're gonna live, oh, now I'm gonna live to be 90 instead of, you know, 82, right? You go, that's great. Okay, I'll start to eat more cucumbers, right? This is the same thing. This is prolonging tissue health. And so fillers in my mind, then begin to be used for cosmetics and aesthetics. Somebody wants fuller lips for a special event. Somebody wants a real pop in their cheek beyond what their given native structure is. Gotcha. And I might use fillers. So to me, this is a completely different situation. And yes, you pay more for this procedure that treats the entire face and slows down the aging process than you would for fillers. And you, it would be pro cost prohibitive to do the amount of fillers that you would do with fat. Because the average amount of fat graft is gonna be like 30 milliliters, you know, in a younger woman. What have you, know? you been able to do? And what is the new process and the new technique that you've become so famous for? So I think, you know, one, 95% of women that have facelifts also are undergoing fat grafting and probably 80% of them are undergoing some form of laser. So we treat sun damage, volume loss, and laxity. Laxity with it is treated by a facelift. My preference is to use as short a scar as possible um, so that one, you have to take into consideration the length of a woman's sideburn. In a man, it doesn't matter. But in a woman, if the sideburn is short, then the incision loops around the sideburn because if you make the incision in the hair, pull the skin up, you chop the sideburn off. And people don't notice scars, they notice distortions. Absolutely. If the distortion is associated with a scar, yes, you see the scar. But if you only have a scar, no distortions, there's no way to know somebody had a good facelift. Just no way to tell unless you get super close. So number one is planning the incisions. Two, in the front, we used to put the incision in the junction of the ear and the skin of the cheek. We actually put the incision on the colored part of the ear by just a couple millimeters. Wow. It doesn't drag into this tissue and it's less noticeable because you don't see a white scar between kind of an ear that has some color to it and skin that doesn't. Two, the incision comes behind this part called the tragus. So you don't see this incision in front that sometimes trap doors that. And three, you spare this little opening right below the tragus and come around. And then depending on how much skin is in the neck and how much extra tissue is in the neck because the neck can look terrible, but it can, it can be skin only, and it can be glands and muscles and fat that are below muscles in other patients. So if somebody has a very big neck, you think, oh, I'm going to take out a ton of skin. But the reality is once you carve out those structures and you redrape the skin, it's now not going like this. It's going like that. So you oftentimes have very little skin to remove. So we've been able to shorten the scar behind the ear in many patients, especially when they're having, you know, mini lifts, you know, and when they have mini lifts, they still have a very nice impact on the neck. It's just this scar doesn't have to come along the hairline. So there, that's another feature that I think has modernized the facelift. 